Welcome back. Welcome back. After the largest anti-China protests in almost two decades broke out last week in Tibet, the crackdown by the Chinese authorities continues to intensify. Hundreds of Chinese troops have poured into the region after unrest spread into the neighboring Chinese provinces. China has accused the exiled Dalai Lama, the spiritual and political head of the Tibetan people, of stirring up the trouble in the region just five months before the Olympics in Beijing. And I'm joined now by the EU coordinator from the Tibetan government in exile, Tenzin Wangmo Dunshu. Tenzin, welcome. Good to have you with us. Um, what, do you, what do you say to this suggestion that the Dalai Lama has been responsible for these protests and riots and violence when he is profoundly anti-violence? Um, do you regard these as just defensive tactics by the Chinese or what? This is an unjustified accusation against His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And the best way to see what is the reality is to send some inviga inviga uh, investigation team to Dharamsala to look in to His Holiness the Dalai Lama's office and also his uh, administration. You would say he is, you would say he is innocent on all these things that uh, the Chinese suggest he's been doing, would you? Yes, absolutely, yes. His Holiness the Dalai Lama was always um, advising us to, um, to take the non-violent approach to solve the Tibetan issue. And what do you think, we've, we've heard of figures between 13 people, 13 Tibetans having died in these riots with the response of the Chinese, from 13 to 99 here mentioned in a BBC report. Um, what do you think is the uh, tragic figure? We have to confirm 99 um, uh, casualties. And uh, we also know that 20 years before, um, in 1989, when uh, the massacre took place in Tiananmen, that the Chinese government um, stated that no one uh, was killed. And we have the figure in the international media, there was the figure of 100,000. Do you want people to support Tibet by, for instance, um, boycotting the Olympic Games in, in Beijing? Um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan exile government leaders um, don't want to boycott the um, Olympic Games in Beijing. Um, but we want to also that they are raising the human rights issues. And the, the Dalai Lama is quoted here as saying the Dalai Lama threatened to step down as the political head of the government in exile if the violence continued. That would be He's bad news for you. That would be almost unthinkable, wouldn't it, that the Dalai Lama would step down? His Holiness the Dalai Lama stated also in the past, if the majority of the Tibetan people are choosing for a, non uh, for a violent uh, approach to solve the t uh, Tibetan problem, then he will step down. Uh, and we all know that in 95, uh, during, uh, in the 10th March statement of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he, he proposed a referendum uh, about a solution for the Tibetan problem. And then in 97, 65% of the Tibetan people um, chose uh, for the nonviolent way to solve the Tibetan problem. So if this time the, um, the Tibetan people, after, uh, after a referendum, choose the, no, uh, the violent way, then His Holiness will step down. You've said just now that you um, don't want a boycott of the Olympic Games. What do you need, what do you want in the way of support or action from the international community? We want that the international community is sending a fact-finding team um, to investigate the situation, the real ground situation in Tibet. Uh, we want also that uh, all the prisoners are um, released and also that, the, um, that they are uh, not 
being um, um, that they are not being tortured. We know that more than 1,000 people are arrested at the moment, and I, I'm sure that the figure will raise in, within the next uh, days. And we also want that the international community is urging the Chinese leadership to, um, to engage with His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, at the top level. Thank you very much indeed, Tenzin. A report for the European Union last week highlighted significant potential conflicts over energy resources in the future. And the most immediate and the most serious potential flashpoint concerned the Arctic. The polar ice caps are melting, and that means vast energy resources are suddenly becoming accessible. Last year, Russian scientists put a Russian flag in the seabed at the Arctic. But other countries, including the US, also have claims. With so much at stake, some are even predicting a second Cold War could break out. Cold, appropriately enough, over the Arctic. With me from our studio in New York is Mead Treadwell, the director of the US Arctic Research Commission. And from Washington, I'm joined by Ariel Cohen, a senior research fellow for Russian and Eurasian studies at the Heritage Foundation. Gentlemen, to both of you, welcome. Uh, can I begin with you, Mead? I mean, because you've lived in Alaska for the past 30 years, and so you're in a position particularly to sum up what are the energy resources that people should know about in the Arctic? How significant are they? Uh, <coughs> David, I think they're very significant. Uh, we had a briefing just recently from the Geological Survey, and uh, the, the number has been tossed around that perhaps a quarter of the world's undiscovered oil and gas is in the Arctic. And that's not just in Alaska, Russia, Canada. Uh, you've got uh, huge deposits uh, expected to be found off Greenland uh, and, uh, of course, uh, northern Norway. So uh, energy is very important for the people who live in the Arctic. And in terms of the Arctic changing, how, how has that made resources more accessible? Well, you have a much thinner uh, Arctic ice cap. In fact, you've had, uh, in September of two of the last uh, three years, we've had minimums that have never been seen in, in human history before. And so it's going to mean that the Arctic Ocean can be a new Mediterranean. It can be a uh, venue for not just for shipping, uh, fishing, and, uh, but also energy development. Ariel, uh, with you being such an expert on the Russian situation and so on, uh, we mentioned there the, uh, the Russian flag on the seabed and so on, and President Putin made the people who did that appear like heroes and so on. How hungry is Russia for the Arctic? Russia is hungry for great geopolitical adventures, and this whole debate is bringing me back to the 19th century, to the scramble for Africa, and other colonial possessions. And what I learned from that is that human nature has not changed, that greed is still a driving force in human behavior, and that the Russians really want to grab that oil and gas in Arctica. But planting of the flag is nothing to be concerned with. Mr. Putin himself said, if the Russians planted the flag in the Arctic, it has no more significance than Americans claiming the moon because Americans planted their flag uh, on the moon. I see. And, and how far do you think, in your judgment and your colleagues' judgments, how far do you think Russia would go with this? Would it go as far as a Cold War situation? Would it go as far as a hot war situation? The Russians are trying to put this claim through a UN tribunal. And as long as the UN tribunal has not adjudicated on this territorial claim on the seabed of the Arctic Ocean, uh, the size of the claim is several times the size of the country of France. Uh, as long as there's no decision by the tribunal, the Russian claim is basically um, is just that, a claim. But uh, if the United States... Canada, Denmark, and Norway, the, the principal Arctic countries, supported by UK and others, will fight the Russian claim, which I think is baseless. Then the Russians will have no legal standing, and the only way they can exercise that claim 
is by putting the Russian Navy in the Arctic to protect that territory that the Russians are claiming. Now, I do not believe Moscow has the strength, the power, the wherewithal to claim this huge territory, but I do believe that we have to find an international regime possibly to negotiate a convention and to have a tribunal, UN-based or otherwise, to adjudicate these competing claims. It will be idiotic uh, to start a cold war, a hot war, or a lukewarm war on something that a bunch of geographers and lawyers can adjudicate between themselves. Thank you very much indeed. Coming back to you, Mead, as someone who's devoted the last 30 years to the wilds of Alaska and Arctic, do you fear when you hear all of this for the for the peace of the most undisturbed area in the world, possibly, being disrupted by all of this tension and so on? Or do you see a way of dispelling it? We have been doing our homework and helping the Russians do their homework so we don't have conflict. And in fact, uh, this claim for new lands in the Arctic, uh, the U.S. is working on its own claim. We may claim as much as uh, uh, the size of California. And I don't see it as greed as Ariel does. I see it as, as a way to sort out what we have up there. So let's try in the Arctic to keep this cooperation going on science, even as people may posture on what the boundaries are, because I think we can work it out. Well, thank you both very much indeed. Mead, there in New York, yes. thank you very much indeed. David, thank you. Ariel, there in Washington, thank you very much indeed. We shall doubtless look forward to returning to this subject again. Thank you both.